What's up, everybody? Tom Pelissero here with Judd Zolgad. Judd, the NFL offseason officially underway. New mm-hmm. league year doesn't start until March 12th, but the Super Bowl yesterday. And how about this? Not to compare Christian Ponder to Joe Flacco any more than I've ever compared Christian Ponder to Eli Manning, but if you want to believe Rick Spielman's theory that it takes four to five years, which a lot of people still believe, for court, certain quarterbacks to come into their own, yep. you can once again look at a guy like Joe Flacco who... A month and a half ago, there was talk about, will the Ravens even keep him around? Now, that wasn't realistic from the inside, from everything I've heard. They were always going to find some sort of way to extend Joe Flacco, but all of a sudden they're going to have to pay him three times as much as they were offering him back in August because he wins the Super Bowl and looked pretty good doing it. And so if you assume that this is the right track, right, Flacco, it's basically Eli Manning, right? You go, Eli Manning was brutal when he came up a lot of times. had a lot of brutal games. And then he got things straight. He came on in the middle of his fourth and came year. On, right. And so now Joe Flacco has done it. Boy, though, you know, it's still interesting. Do you see this from, you know, in all seriousness, do you see this from Ponder? Because the thing you see with Flacco now is, and this is the funny thing or the sad thing about if you watch the playoffs, you watch the elite teams, you watch the elite quarterbacks, how they operate. Watching the Vikings, it's not like watching a different sport, but it's like watching it at a different level. And I'm being serious. I mean, Adrian Peterson is the best of the best. We all know that. But the quarterback play, when you see... Joe Flacco, I would never say he's sexy, right? Colin Kaepernick, it, it's sexy, right? I mean, if, if he's playing well... If that's the term you want to use, sure. Right, but I'm just saying, exciting. Joe Flacco isn't like that, but what makes Flacco, to me, so interesting is when he has to make a throw, when he has to make a smart decision, he makes, for the most part, right now, the exact right decision. 11 touchdowns in the postseason, which tied a playoff record, and more importantly, no picks. I yeah. mean, this guy was, this guy, if you watched him, if you watched him, was as good as it gets. Well, yeah, Do you see Ponder on that track? I don't know. Well, I don't know. I mean, we're talking about two completely different quarterbacks because Flacco does not have Ponder's mobility. You're not going to try to get him outside the pocket. He is a pocket passer, which is a rare breed at this point. Mm-hmm. He also has elite arm talent. You put Joe Flacco probably up into the same category as a Jay Cutler in terms of guys who can just flat out wing it. Ponder does not have a bad arm, but he uh, he does not have an, an elite type of an arm either. That's right. something we've seen now when they've had some more vertical uh, elements into the offense as they've gotten comfortable with Jim Caldwell calling the plays. All, all those different parts fit together. It will be interesting to see how the Vikings offense evolves, and that's what we're here to talk about today, just looking at some things that they've got to be able to get done now going into the offseason, a little more than a month from, month from free agency, about two and a half months away from the NFL draft. I can tell you this, Judd. There's not 100% confidence in the locker room in in Bill Musgrave and in the offense that they've been running so far. Now, there's a variety of different things that go into that. I think that there are some guys, and I talked to various people around the team while doing the postseason grades. There are some people who will say, absolutely, Bill Musgrave has no culpability whatsoever in what happened in the playoff game because you've got to be interchangeable, and that's completely on Joe Webb. He's got to be able to be be ready and go out and execute the game plan. There's other people who just don't trust the ability to adapt and the willingness to adapt to certain situations. I think that you could look at the first half of the season and the second half of the season. Bill Musgrave did a lot of his best work in the second half of the season after they lost Percy Harvin. You started spreading the ball around. You didn't have to think about forcing the ball to Percy to keep Percy happy, to keep the media happy. There's, there's all these different things that fit right. together, but from a personnel perspective, right. Judd, the number one thing, and it's obvious, They've got to be able to fix what they have going on at the receiver position. Mm -hmm. Flat out, you need to be able to have somebody who's going to create mismatches in the intermediate to deep passing game. They don't have that right now. That's the number one goal. And I wouldn't be surprised if they explore every single avenue, free agency as well as the draft, to be able to do that. And honestly, when you look at this offense, how do you grade Bill Musgrave or Ponder completely? I mean, to me, because of the lack of a true vertical threat. Now, Jarius Wright and Percy Harvin can go deep, okay? They can be vertical threats but they're slot receivers. How do you judge these two guys based on what they were given by the front office? It's hard to. I mean, they just they didn't have – Michael Jenkins isn't that guy. There's nobody that they put on the field who you would say, okay, that's your vertical threat. Let's see what Jerome he can Simpson do. Jerome Simpson, if you were healthy. Had he been healthy, you, I think hold there Hold on a second. Do you, really, do you really, really believe that completely? Because I enjoy- Go back to the first game he played against Detroit. He right, draws but, but two defensive pass interference penalties and goes up and catches a 29-yard pass on the side. Go back to his Bengals days, too, and you saw... Oh, you can't trust inconsist- him. Right, you can't trust him. What I'm saying is they don't have anybody that you completely said we can 100% trust. And I'll go back to my theory, which was all along, nobody at Winter Park thought this team would be 10-6. and six. They never thought they'd be in a position where they said, we don't have a vertical threat. You know what? That's a really bad thing. They thought they took a chance on Simpson. And I think in their heart of hearts, they thought this might work, it might not work. But it's not a big deal if it doesn't work. Well, it turned out to be a bigger deal. You couldn't assume that he was going to end up having the back injury and never be the same guy And you do, But you couldn't assume a thing with him. You hoped he would turn out to be a good player, and 
you can sign them long term. That's not going to happen. My point being, though, is I really think going into next season, to me, the jury is still out on Ponder and Musgrave because I want to see them given everything to work with. And once that happens, if they don't do their jobs, then you've got a real problem. But in this season, they did not get everything. And there was no question in my mind. Yeah, it starts. The offensive line was better. They made some good moves there. The mm-hmm. running back is phenomenal. He's great. The tight ends were there. The tight end position is where I had my most problem with Musgrave because I didn't think that he utilized Kyle Rudolph as well as he could have. But when it comes to receivers, I can't blame the guy. I really Part can't. of the thing with Rudolph, too, though, is you were making him your inline strong side tight end, meaning that you're looking to get some blocking from him. He's mm-hmm. not, you know, talking to scouts, he's not really a detachable guy who's going to scare you with speed. And so there's certain things you got to be able to do. Now, when you look at the production, he was shut out, what, three times this season? Yeah. That can't happen. Right. But, but there's a variety of different things that go into that. And part of it is you had a run-based offense this year. Everything was running through Adrian Peterson. As the offense evolves and as players evolve and as you fill some of your personnel holes, number yep. one being at the receiver position, you'd think the offense is going to evolve with that as well. I would agree with you, but the one thing with Rudolph that frustrated me was this. He is one guy. Ordinarily, you don't want to force balls in, right? You don't want to force passes. Rudolph is the one guy that you got to say, I'm going to throw the ball to him, and he's either going to break it up because it's not going to be catchable, or he's going to catch the ball because he can win those competitions. Well, what teams started doing was they got very physical with Kyle Rudolph. So you put your hands on the guy, you don't allow him to even get in and out of his break. All of a sudden, it becomes tough even for a Rudolph because you know there's no threat that he's going to double move you and go vertical. Right. That's just not there. Right. But once in a while, I mean, there were more opportunities. Like you said, he shouldn't have been shut out. I mean, that shouldn't have. You shouldn't look at the stats and see targeted Kyle Rudolph 0 or 1. I mean, that just simply shouldn't happen. But that's my, that is really, if you think about it, the only complaint, because like I said, when it comes to wide receiver, who did they have? The only argument I would have made with Percy Harvin, and they eventually did this with Jarius Wright, was we get far too in love with, this guy is a slot receiver, so this is the only role he can play. That's not true. Percy Harvin, if you wanted to when he was healthy, could have gone deep down the field. Is that ideal, though? Absolutely not. You've also got to figure out what you're going to do with Percy Harvin and what Percy Harvin wants to do here, and that's something that I was told he did, in fact, make it back for his exit physical, which you have to. I mean, you're required yeah. to under NFL rules, so he came back, got checked out. In fact, that, in fact, that could help him get traded. Yeah. I mean, because well, uh, you can't not come back. Right. I mean, the, the ankle has healed at this point. Yeah. The appendectomy, he's also healed from that. You've, you've got to be able to figure out, is, does Percy Harvin, is he interested in signing a long-term deal with the Minnesota Vikings, or does he end up, want to end up somewhere else on his next contract? His value from a production standpoint is probably going to be about as high as it is, even with all these other things swirling around in the background. Somebody would be willing to pay him. Now, would somebody be willing to trade for him? I really don't think you get a first-round pick because first-round picks are so cheap and so valuable right now. Right. So if it's if it's a two, if it's a three, you're sort of running a, da- a little bit of a dance here because if you're the Vikings, too, you know those fines are so high now if you hold out from training camp. Yep. Percy Arvin's base, co- base salary did go up to almost $3 million next season, so it's not as though he can make nothing for coming back. He's already hit a bunch of escalators that increase that. They might end up looking at now, but the thing is with Percy, you also know he's not going to do anything quietly. If he decides to make a trade demand, that's going to get out. Well, here's the problem too. Let's say he thinks he's going to be a good soldier. So let's say Percy Harvin comes back to play the last year of his contract. He's still unsigned, and he says, "I'm going to do this." Percy Harvin can't help himself. He is going to be a problem in that locker room. You know it. I know it. Well, and so the, the, so the yeah. so you either sign him long term, which I don't think they should do, but let's say they do. You either sign them long term, make them happy, and say shut up and go play football, or you say Percy, we're going to move you. There is no way on earth, if I'm Rick Spielman, if I'm Les Frazier, I allow Percy Harvin back in that facility on the last year of his contract, because he's going to be a pain in the butt, and you made a lot of positive yeah. strides, and he is the exact type of guy in that type of, of you know, the way he would feel. He's the exact type of guy you don't want there. Well, let's also remember this, too. Percy Harvin signed a five-year contract as a first-round draft pick. The plan was never on either side for him to play out the yeah. fifth year of that deal. Percy's made clear he expects a new contract after the season, and the Vikings always intended, if he played up the snuff, that they would end up uh, being able to extend him at this stage, as they've done it. That's their philosophy. Doing that with a lot of their players. Real quick, before we wrap up this offense video, I think you also have to look at Michael Jenkins is due a, a roster bonus of over $2 million in March. I can't see any scenario in which he collects that, even though he did make some plays for him down the stretch next season. So he's not back. Jerome Simpson, maybe he's back on a non-guaranteed deal no because he doesn't have a whole lot of value out on the free agent market. Devin Aroma should do. You're moving on there. You're going to move forward <laughs> with Jarius Wright. Stephen Burton's going to get some opportunities. You're going to look heavily into free agency. Maybe you do pursue a Mike Wallace like the pursuit of Pierre Garçon mm-hmm. last year. There's other guys out there like Greg Jennings who might not find the value that he's expecting on the free agency market. But he wants to go to Miami and play. 
And Miami is one of the teams that's got about $40, $50 million in cap yeah. space to be able to work with. Also, don't forget the offensive guard position. Brandon Fusco struggled at times this season, showed some signs late in the season. Charlie Johnson, another guy who's due a roster bonus in March, has a, a pretty high cap number for an average to slightly below average guard in the NFL. It'll be interesting. We'll talk about the defense tomorrow. He's Judd Tom, full Vikings coverage at 1500ESPN.com. We'll see you.